دوباره به شهر زیبای شما بیام و در این جلسه شرکت بکنم well, in... دوستان ارجمن Dear friends ما در اصل جهانی شدن به سر میبریم We are at a time where we are seeing universalization of concepts. The world is becoming a home. The world is becoming a village, actually. However, in this universalization or globalization, we can really see that unfortunately only the trade has become really global. So therefore, in that sense, we are witnessing how globalization is making the poor poorer and the richer richer. Business are no longer taking ethics into account. The capital of the equity of some company is larger than the national assets, the assets of some countries. Globalization can only be, will only be a positive change for our, for our world as long as it will make values to be universal and global as well. And the value that must be the most important value that should be globalized or made universal is justice. We are very well aware of the fact that there are many countries in the world that are deprived of the blessing of democracy. There are dictators in countries, countries that are using mili the, the, their armies and that they are getting finance from corruption and that they are oppressing their people. These countries also commit heinous crimes, crimes that prevail for many, many decades in the history of these people. In a non-democratic system, the legal system is clearly damaged, is clearly undermined. One of the key characteristics of democracy within society is the absolute and full independence of the legal system. So if we find a country where democracy is being weaker and weaker, clearly the independence of the legal system would also become weaker and weaker. We can clearly see how anti-democratic countries have courts that only focus on fulfilling the interest and the wishes of the ruling governments. And then justice is put in the second place and victims are deprived of receiving justice. In order to make justice a universal concept, we have had the fight and the struggle of many people, many people who are behind trying to achieve and to obtain justice. 
to make justice global. There are many people who are fighting for it, who are working really hard for that. And the result of one of those efforts will be to have courts, courts that will effectively make justice universal. Well, the studies of that court were approved, adopted in Rome in the year 2002. The Rome Statutes have a number of limitations, and I believe that the most important limitation of the Rome Statutes is that that establishes that the signatory countries and partner countries and the state countries can file a claim. And actually, there is no doubt that anti-democratic countries, they have never, they have never adhered, they have never ratified the Rome Statutes. Why is this so? Well, because they are really afraid of the enforcement of justice. And if a country decides to adhere, to adopt these statutes, they will have, they will, there is only one solution for these type of cases. And that is to say that these countries or that these cases will be dealt with by the Security Council of the United Nations. We, for instance, in the case of Sudan and the crimes committed there by Oman Bashir, well, we've seen how this case was brought to the court. However, there was a problem in there. The Security Council of the United Nations, there are five countries that have the power to veto the agreements. And therefore, according to this right, independence is lost. For instance, the case of Syria and the crimes that Bashar has committed and continues to commit, same as well, China and Russia vetoed, vetoed that agreement and did not allow for this case to reach the courts. This right to veto, this veto power, it is one of the major limitations for justice to become globalized or becomes universal, as I said before. In terms of the limitations of criminal courts are many more than those that I'm sharing with you today. Because time is limited for my presentation, as I say, I'm not going to discuss all the limitations and all the challenges. However, I like to reach a more important point than that. And I would like to ask you a question, to raise a question. Countries that have a judiciary system, an independent judiciary system that favor democracy and justice. Aren't those countries accountable to enforce and to make justice universal? Don't you feel any responsibility yourselves as democratic countries? If any crime against humanity is committed any place in the world, don't you feel any kind of responsibility? How come? Could it be the case that whenever there is a natural disaster, an earthquake, flooding, you name it? Of course, there are a number of victims and casualties. Whenever that happens, right after 
many countries in the world, and especially northern countries, start to help, to send out help, humanitarian help, uh, blankets, clothing, food. They help them out. Therefore, they try to show to their victims that we are solidary. We are solidary with their suffering, that we stand by them. And the question now is, why this feeling of solidarity does not exist in the field of justice? Well, you become empathetic with victims of an earthquake that have lost their homes. You send out money. You open bank accounts to collect money for them. But what about your awareness? What happens whenever a dictator in Iran in only one week kills 3,000 political prisoners? Doesn't it touch you? That that happened in Iran? Is that stronger? Is it more shocking than an earthquake? Because you can be empathetic with the victims of an earthquake. And what happens with the victims of justice? Don't you feel the same thing? Can't you feel the same thing? That is the responsibility of democratic countries, countries that feel proud of being democratic countries, countries that have good legal systems, good laws, they have independent judiciaries. Well, if you are so proud of having all that, you have the obligation as well as the responsibility to make justice universal. I can remember the day when the arrest order was issued against Pinochet. I was in Iran myself. I can remember it perfectly all right. It was one of the best days of my life. And why I'm saying that? Well, because I could feel the hope. I could feel that justice was being enforced. Sooner or later, justice is served. Why don't you continue along those that path? That is your responsibility. In some countries of the world, including my country, Eden, justice has been damaged. Because the courts are no longer independent. Our courts have become puppets, puppets of the government and of government officials. I have clients who were political prisoners because they were practicing a religion different from the Muslim religion. When they were interrogated, the government officials used to ask them, or used to tell them, if you do not cooperate with us, if you do not collaborate with us, we will tell the courts. To give you a five-year sentence in prison, and when my clients refused or said that he was not willing to cooperate, with them, then it was found, well, on the records there was no evidence or no proof of the charges that were being brought against that person. We could also see how this person were being treated. And then the same official that on day number one says you will be sentenced to five years of prison, at the end of the day, at the end of the trial, that sentence was dropped. I could see, I saw with my own eyes 
how the head of the secret services of the government was there as an expert. He was an expert witness. And he was a representative of the people. And he was there taking part in the trial. So it is just impossible to enforce justice, to implement justice in a system like that. That's the reason that the lawyers that defend political prisoners, they are themselves chased by the government. Well, in the last five years, more than 50 lawyers have been pursued and some of them had to face years of sentence like Mr. Saldani, he has been sentenced to more than 13 years in prison He's a dear friend. He has received the Nuremberg Prize for human rights. Another friend, Natsinso, today, she has been sentenced to six years in prison. She has served three years in prison now, and last year she received the Saharov Prize for Human Rights. That is to say, a person that has been awarded with the Saharov Prize for Human Rights, or a person that has been awarded an international prize, and has appeared before the court and has been has defended. The only thing has done is to, de to, to do, it has defended. Its client is not protected whatsoever by the government. So in my country, if you are a journalist, you cannot really oppose the government. You cannot really say that you are against anything. a political system that does that to a person who has been awarded with an international prize. And on the top of that, the assets of that person are confiscated, are seized. And this person is asked to keep silent. Now, think about the treatment that a poor university person receives. University people do not dare to speak out their minds. Now I'd like to share with you a very painful experience back in 2009. In 2009, a group of university students at the Tehran University has taken to the streets to demonstrate against the election results. At 3 o'clock in the morning, they were attacked by the police. The police broke into their bedrooms. And as a result of that, five university students were killed, and many more were injured. And friends of those university students took photographs of what happened. And some of those students who took the photographs were brave enough to report these facts. Despite having sufficient evidence, what do you imagine that happened? No policemen were arrested. And the students who reported the facts now are serving their sentence. 
because the judge said that these people had been the day before out in the street demonstrating against. And I have to say that Iran is not the one and only country that has a situation like that. Unfortunately, many countries in the world are going through the same thing. For instance, countries such as Saudi Arabia or Syria or Yemen. And if not, let us think about other countries in Latin America. In those countries, justice is not enforced, is not implemented. They cannot rely on justice because they are ruled by people who are not interested in justice being implemented. And the victims in those countries do not have a voice, are not given a voice. Me, as a representative of these people who do not have a voice, I am here with you today. And I'd like to ask you to you all at the audience here today, what is your responsibility in face of that situation? Do you want to close your eyes right now? Do you want to have peace of mind? Don't you feel responsible at all? Don't you feel that you are responsible and accountable and you have to help them out? Don't you want to help those people who do not have any possibility whatsoever to receive justice? Wouldn't you like other countries to help them receive the justice that they are not receiving? Spain has an excellent record in these matters. Spain must be very, very proud for having arrested, for having prosecuted these dictators for having issue arrest warrants. Hopefully, Spain will go back to where it was, and Spain hopefully will become again a pioneer in terms of justice, a world pioneer. Politicians focus on economic interests and on political interests, but the political interests of the country must be, look, must be looked at the long term. If uh, were a, ministry, a minister for justice, and if I want to implement justice, and if I think that if I implement justice here today, I will lose out lots of important business contracts for my country, I am going against the national interest of my country. Because here I can see a representative of the Tibet. And I would like to share with you a very painful experience I went through. Me, together with a number, with other people who have received the Nobel Peace Prize, together with Dalai Lama, we were invited to Latin America. Well, and please apologize me if I don't say out the name of that country because I do not intend to tag or to say bad things about a country. But I just would like to share with you to tell you about the possible repercussions of a bad decision. So as I say, we had been invited to celebrate the Independence Day of that country. So a number of um, authors or writers were invited over there. So they sent us the flight tickets and Dalai Lama was in our group. But unfortunately, last minute, 
the Chinese government announced that if they didn't withdraw their invitation to His Holiness Dalai Lama, we will remove the aid that you are receiving of $200 million for you to build up your uh, arena, football arena. And then that government withdrew the invitation to His Holiness Dalai Lama so the rest of the people, as a way to demonstrate against that, we decided not to go to that country at that time and never come back to that country. So, but it is not important that we didn't visit that country, but what is important is what the history will tell us, will tell about us. And Spain has been proud, is proud of being the country that issued the arrest warrant against Mrs. Mr. Pinochet versus toward that country that I'm just referring to, who will never feel proud. We never feel proud of selling out its reputation in exchange for a football arena. So we cannot really sell out our justice. We cannot trade it. We cannot trade it off in favor of political and economic interests. Let us help those countries. Let us make justice truly universal. Let us help. Let us make these countries that are ruled by dictators to become smaller and smaller. Let us build a smaller world for perpetrators. And if we achieve that, our world will be a better world. Thank you so much. Señora Evadi. Miss Evadi. Thank you very much for your attendance to this forum. Thank you very much for your kind words. Hi, can you hear me? So let's keep going to see if they can hear you. So as I was saying, Ms. Abadi, thank you very much So it's working now. Thank you very much for your attendance to this forum. Thank you for your kind words, for your reflections, and thank you especially for being so brave, for struggling and fighting and for disseminating actually this idea of justice and freedom. And thank you for your denunciation of the, all the activities that go against that. You referred to Rome Statute, or the Statute of the ICSD. And so you refer to countries such as Russia, Russia China, the US, countries which are permanent members of the Security Council and so they have veto power. Question, question for you would be the following. Do you think the fact that these countries have not ratified the Institute, don't you think it proves that the ICC, which was a historical event of great significance, don't you think it's been kidnapped or abducted by large powers? Mm. 
کشورهای نیرومند کشورهای نیرومند those powerful powers those powerful countries such as china russia russia the us and some other countries which are smaller in size such as israel iran saudi arabia they didn't want to adhere to the icc and why is that? Because they fear they'll be prosecuted themselves. The ICC has several limitations and different problems. That's only natural. But we have to do here would be to try and solve all these problems. So it is not possible for us to say that since we find troubles, then the court is pointless. It doesn't work like that. So my advice for civil society in those countries where the government has not adhered to the court, what I say is, the minute that government is changed after elections, and right before giving way to a dictator to gain power to come to office, first thing they should do, probably they need to try and adhere to the ICC, as it was the case in Tunisia. When Ben Ali left power when he stepped down, the group that got to the office does what they did, decided to adhere, which give, gave way or, or made it possible for Tunisia not to have civil war. Because those that got to the office realized that if they want to do what they want, if they want to commit crimes against their own people, then the ICC somehow will put an end to that, will stop them. And so, as law lawmakers, we need to raise awareness in our society, especially within the civil society, and lobby and governments to have them adhere to the ICC. By the time that the ICC becomes even more empowered, more justice will be served all over the world. Ali, there is this other question about the situation of women in Iran. What, what can the international community do against serious violations of human rights, uh, rights of human of, of men and women in Iran? What are the effects of these Collins for action by organizations such as Amnesty International? After the revolution in Iran, many laws were passed that were discriminating for women. And I would like to give you a few examples of those discriminating laws that were passed. The, a, a woman's life is worth half a man's life. So if I'm with my brother and we both have an accident, down the street, and so we end up uh, injured. The reparation or remedy that my brother gets is twice as high as what I get or what my family gets. If we have to, we are at, at, at court, you need two women to testify, and that is the same as a man. A man could marry several women at the same time. Many other discriminating facts, which of course many women oppose in Iran. The feminist movement in Iran is very powerful. In the years that led to, before today, for example, in 2004, child guardianship or custody was changed in favor of 
mothers. But until we achieve the final target that would be changing all laws that are discriminating against women, we still have a long way ahead of us. As, uh, even today, there is stone, sto kill, uh, death by stone in, um, in my country. I think that the most important contribution by the international community would be to make the voices of women heard all over the world. Women in Iran need to have their voices heard all over the world. They are opposing the government. They don't want these laws and they are worthy of much more democratic laws and that's our request. And we would also like our government to prosecute those criminals that violate human rights. And it's not punishing the Iranian people. Iranian people shouldn't be victims. International governments should prosecute political leaders that commit those offenses. They should not be granted access into Europe. If they have anything owned in Europe, this should be taken away from them. This needs to be sized because it has to be like this. No just pecuniary punishment on the life of Iranian people so that they are becoming poorer and poorer. even conscious of, of, of how different the situation is, but still, what would you say to political leaders in consolidated democracies where they still refer to the intellectual inferiority of women when they speak? It is just, Miss Evadi, maybe you are not familiar with this piece of news. And this is a comment, a remark made by a political leader who's running for elections as representative for the European elections. And, and he uh, humiliated uh, this way an opposing female leader. Well, since uh, elections are around the corner, let me not to refer who who said what, what said, what was said. Let me just give you my general opinion. Any man who thinks that women are an equal to men. A man, a man who thinks that women are inferior and don't have the same power as men actually are abusing their own mothers. And it is so terrible when you are not respectful to your own mother, when you abuse your own mother's memory. Here, they express uh, gratitude for your being so brave and uh, fighting and struggling for justice. Kids nowadays in Syria, well, we see migration trends in Syria. We find it also elsewhere in Europe, such as Utah and Malia. How can we rescue them from uh, the camps in Jordan? Uh, Jordan? How, how long do we need to wait? Well, first of all, I would like to say the following as Iranian. Because the Iranian government has sent weapons and armies to help out Basal Assad's government 
to murder innocent people. And so I would like to apologize, apologize as Iranian, because we Iranian people do not agree with this kind of foreign affairs policy. As for your question about Syrian refugees, especially kids, well, these kids haven't been to school in over two years. These kids should have had their vaccines given because of their age, but they haven't, and so they get terribly sick in this camps. The most important thing now would be to help help them out, help these kids out, especially re regarding health. Then secondly, education is a paramount topic. And so I hope it comes the day when we can get Bashar al-Assad out of the way and so see how he's held accountable on what he says before an independent court. If it weren't for the help of uh, the Iranian government and the Hezbollah, Mr. Bashar would have fled the country in the first two months of the popular uh, upheaval or uprising. Please do not forget, do not forget that the Syrian people used to be very peaceful when they went out on the streets to be part of the demonstration, but the Iranian government together with the Hezbollah, they oppressed the Syrian people and they forced the government to stay in power and then stay in office. And then, as a consequence, that there's been an elongation, an extension of this civil war in time, Islamists and fundamentalists opened away and took advantage of the situation to steal the revolution from the Syrian people. They walked into Syria as opposer against Bashar Ashad and started a war against him. And that is exactly what the Iranian government wanted from Syria. And they had planned it like that for Syria. What's going on now? Well, Iran, Iran forced the world into uh, two options. Well, keeping Bashar, who is a, a war criminal, or get the Islamists or fundamentalists who are also war criminals. But the Iranian government forgets about a third option, which is assisting the free democratic people of Syria who find themselves in Syria and oppose Abashar. Those are the people that need to get to office instead of thinking, okay, we only have two options and we need to choose between one of these two. I, we need to go and help Syrian people out, help those who are opposing and those who want democracy and freedom in Syria. So, another question, what's to be done when a country such as Spain has been blindfolded and won't, won't listen to, won't listen to the crimes committed under Franco's regime after so many years, sorry about that, without having sorted out the problems of victims victims of such crimes under Franco's regime. So the question is, do we need to give up, to settle down and forget? And Mr. Marino says, that could never be it. When a government closes its eyes and, 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 and makes everything in its power not to listen to the voices of victims, 
Then we need to speak up, to shout even louder. We need to hold hands. We need to shout as loud as we can to the extent that the government, to the point where the government won't pretend to be deaf anymore. Your shouting will wake the government up out of their deep sleep and that's the only option out of it, only way out of it. Ms. Abadi, President of the Iranian Association for Human Rights in Spain, apart from thanking the International Foundation for having opened this forum, has this question for you. In, car in the situation of current affairs in Spain and after we have lost the rights that we have achieved after so much struggle, what similarities do you find about setbacks in human rights compared to the Iranian people? In Spain, when there was a law, a law adapted or enacted uh, and when it was decided that you couldn't fight against wars against humanity, sorry, crimes against humanity committed um, outside of Spain. Well, I was, I, I remember, and I was here in Spain. I, I love Spain, and I was here as, as many other times. I come here often, and I remember I had been invited to the lawyers bar here in Spain, and there was a conference there. And that's when I regretted it. How could you allow for this law to be changed? And I told so to lawyers, and I held them accountable. How can it be that you've remained silent in light of such a terrible thing? How could you allow for the government to change this? Because this had been a reason to be proud for Spanish people everywhere in the world. How could you let the government take that away from you? But I've also liked to say that in Spain, well, Spain cannot be compared to Iran. Listen to your situation in Spain right now. And I know that many of you are unhappy with the situation in Spain, but please, this cannot be compared with Iran. You are a thousand, ten thousand times better off than Iran. If we were to hold this very same conference in Iran, you would be all in prison by now, and you would be serving a two-year sentence. So this is, serves as a reference for comparison. We are about to finish, but still a few questions from our friends from Sahara. And apart from congratulating you on your task, what about Sahara Whip? People where they, they see so many violations of human rights committed by Morocco. The fate of the Sahrawi people is one of the most painful things in human history. Which is a group of people who have been in prison in their own homeland. And their innocent voice is not heard anywhere in the world. Same can be said about Palestine. We see how in, in the, the the Strip, in Gaza, there's uh, this group of women who are fenced in 
The thing is that everyone in the world knows Palestine, Palestine's history, but what percentage of world's population knows the terrible and painful life and fate of Sahrawi people? This is the responsibility of each of us seated right here. International community needs to learn what's the current situation of the Sahrawi people and international, the international community needs to realize what a painful situation Sahrawi people are living in. If the world neglects the suffering of the Sahrawi people and if they don't want to hear it, I think this is our responsibility, it's a burden on all of us. Something needs to be done. We have to do something to compensate for that. So I'm begging you, I'm begging you. The suffering of Sahrawi people living in that, in that part of the world, it has to be discussed, it has to be heard everywhere. If, if the media are in the room, please, I'm begging you, pay attention, pass on the message, pay attention to what's going on in this part of the world, these crimes against the Sahrawi people, please do, do, do give coverage to news from this area. There are many more questions, but I have this very last one before we move on to the closing ceremony. And someone requests your opinion about the new Iranian president or prime minister. Do you think the election has been positive for Iran? Do you think that the reformation, reform process means that they are opening up to freedom and other rights for the Iranian people? Since we're coming to the end of this agenda, and I see that you're very tired, I would like to joke around, if you'll allow me, and that is that the new president in Iran, the only difference with the outgoing president is that he is cuter, that he is more handsome. That's the only difference. There's no difference but for the looks. A negligible difference, actually. According to the Constitution in Iran, the supreme leader, which is the president, uh, which is the president, doesn't have much power, but the prime minister doesn't have much. And that's why President Hatami who was representative of the reformers could not could not meet any of his election promises because he didn't have the powers or the president holds of the power but not the prime minister the same happens with this new one the minute they got into power walked into office the situation of human rights in iran hasn't changed at all just for this one exception and thanks to international pressure and also pecuniary sanctions and punishment on Iran, the president was forced to sit at the negotiation table and talk to Western countries. And I hope those negotiations, those discussions are to be fruitful and so they reach an agreement. But if they happen to reach an agreement, you need to know that this is a result of the pressure, the lobbying and sanctions and punishments on Iran. But as for domestic issues or things having to do with human rights, nothing's changed, nothing's happened. Thank you very much, Sarim. Thank you very much, Shirin. I still would like to give an anecdote here. Something that happened last night as we were having dinner. And I told, um, I, I was talking to Shirin Evadi, and uh, her translator, she's, she's doing a great job. 
I asked if they knew about this Iranian singer called Gugos. And they both looked at me, saying, where are you coming from? What are you talking about? Because yes, there is an Iranian singer, that is Gugosh, and she is impressive. And it was just a coincidence that I found about her, that I learned about it. I, I'm into Arab music. And one day I came across this singer, and I, I thought, this is not Arab language. And I remember from the high court when uh, we had Farsi translators, and I said, okay, she comes from her, she's Iranian. And that's when I started compiling all her CDs. And I'm sharing this anecdote because then, afterwards, this Iranian, Iranian singer had to flee Iran. She's living elsewhere. And Shirin Evadi said, in Iran, women are not allowed to sing. They cannot sing in public. And that's one of the reasons why this singer had to leave her homeland. Just a minute ago, there was this interview with Sirin Evadi for a documentary. And when I asked her, what's Iran? What does being Iranian mean? And, and she replied, that's everything to me. It's a feeling. That's the place where she would like to go back sooner or later, and she will. And I dare to say now that that's our hope. All of us hope for you to go back to your homeland. And let's hope that we can accompany you in your quest back to your homeland, because that means that there's true freedom and democracy in Iran. Thank you very much.